Colossians chapter 1, we got one whopping verse today, so it'll be great. I don't even remember where this was. I guess I'll figure it out as I go. How many of you, um, okay, there's got to be a few more Instagram users in this service than in the last service. Okay, there's a few, there's a few. Um, Okay, I'm going to tell you uh, the definition of a hashtag that I got last service. And this will make you smile because somebody set up and said, I have Instagram. And I was like, great, what's a hashtag? And the definition I got was like, it's one of these, like two lines like this and two lines like this. <laughs> okay, okay, nailed it. Um, what's another name for a hashtag? A pound sign or a number sign, which people used to call it, but nobody calls it that anymore. How many can tell me what it, okay, somebody tell me what is an actual, what does a hashtag do? What is it for? We're talking Instagram here, so if you, if you don't have Instagram, you're not lost. It's, it leads you to something else. Okay, how? <laughs> Just by clicking on it. Yes, okay, good. Um, okay, leave it to a millennial. Emma, speak louder. So, so, if, so if I put hashtag uh, cherry pie, everybody that posts anything about cherry pie will all link to one uh, page. And so I could search on Instagram uh, hashtag cherry pie and anybody that's hashtag cherry pied any of their posts, it would show up in all one big thing. And so uh, now you know why on Facebook, on Instagram, and that, they'll have a list of hashtags about a mile long at the end of all their posts because they're trying to get more posts. If they can put their hashtag uh, a million different ways, it will link their page and their post to a million different things. And then when people are looking on the cherry pie list, they'll click on their post and their post gets more views. And more views leads to more views because the, n- the nasty, big, ugly, green monster of social media is more views and more views and more views. Anyways. Here's why I gave you this social media lesson on Instagram. Because when I was looking at this uh, sermon, I was thinking, man, this is really leading us to one life goal. This is really leading us to one life goal. And so I thought to myself, man, that's all over the place, I think, on Instagram. I've heard people say that lots of times. Hashtag life goals, life goals, life goals. Everything's life goals. 8.9 million posts on hashtag life goals on Instagram. And so I got on there and I was like, we're going to see what the world says is hashtag life goals, or at least the Instagram world, on 8.9 million posts. I did not look at 8.9 million posts, just so you know. But I came up with a list of this is what the world says. They make their posts and they hashtag it life goals and it all goes in the same uh, bucket. And then I got to look at it. So here's what the world says is some life goals according to 8.9 million users on Amazon. Amazon, wow. Instagram. Instagram. Life goals is driving a, a supercar. I was like, okay, bucket list. Life goals is making $37,000 in one week investing. I was like, well, that's pretty nice. Life goals is letting go of hate. I was like, hey, it's not a bad one. Life goals is losing weight. Okay. Life goals is running a marathon. Life goals is buying a house. Life goals is getting married. I was like, hey, getting married. Wow. How old is that post? Anyways, um, <laughs> life goal is becoming an executive. And so I was like, okay, cool. Life goals, this one's philosophical. Life goals is coming to this understanding. Here's the quote. Everything is happening to you. Everything is happening for you to grow. I was like, hmm, okay. Life goals is, okay, there's at least a million posts that have to do with life goals is spending time lifting at the gym, working out at the gym, running on the treadmill at the gym. There's at least a million posts on that. There's 2 million posts at least, or 10 million posts. Uh, Basically, anything about your physical appearance looking better, that's life goals. Uh, Your face, your ears, your head, your feet, your butt, your breasts, your anything is all, if it looks better, that's hashtag life goals. Uh, Walking with puppies on the beach. I thought that one was kind of cute. Life goals. Um, impressing Simon Cowell. How many of you know Simon Cowell? <laughs> yep. Impressing Simon Cowell was hashtag life goals. Okay, this was a decent one. Getting sober. Hashtag life goals. I was like, hey, I'm on board. Finally found one that I like. 
Uh, traveling, seeing the world, watching the sunset from a rooftop somewhere in Europe. This is the best the world can come up with for life goals. Uh, get fit, look a little bit better, uh, make a bunch of money, lose some weight, drive a supercar. The best the world can come up with. Life goals. In my mind, I was thinking, man, if the only life goal you have is to drive a supercar, what are you going to do next? Is this the best you can come up with? I mean, it would be fun. Don't get me wrong. So I made a new sermon title. Uh, the new sermon title is called this. Hashtag one life goal. One life goal. Well, there's one verse to look at. We're going to look at what is all being said there. And then I'm going to give you one life goal. One simple life goal that I think, I think, if you spent your whole life searching after, uh, making posts on Instagram about this one life goal. I have this one life goal and everything feeds into it. I think that if you spent your life doing this, I think I would see 99% of you in heaven. Uh, I think that God would be pleased with our life if we could uh, lose track of the 8.9 million posts about hashtag life goals and just get on board with one life goal that I think is displayed in this passage and I'm going to give to you. So Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, this is the second claim that he makes, that Paul makes in this section about who Jesus Christ is. The first claim he made is that Jesus Christ in verse 15 is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's the first claim. And then he says he's the firstborn, he's the greatest, he's the highest, he's the preeminent over all creation because everything was created through him because he existed before all things. That's the first claim, verse 15, 16, 17. This is the second claim, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Uh, he's the head over all the church. Go back to the beginning of this verse. The head over the body, the church. Most of you probably know, but maybe some of you don't know, the, the church is described as a body. It's a metaphor that's used for the church, the universal church, over and over and over and over again in the scriptures. First Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says it like this. He's talking about spiritual gifts. How is everybody in the church gifted? By the Spirit of God, and you're all gifted in different ways. You're not all gifted to pile back in the tech booth all back there and have everybody in the tech booth and one guy up here preaching. That's not all you're gifting, but some of you are gifted to be back there or up here and sing, or up here and play an instrument, or to teach, or to serve lunch, or to serve in the cafe, or to make meals for people. How are we all gifted by the Spirit of God? First Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says this, but one and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Just as the Spirit wills, he distributes to each member of the body. For even as the body is one, yet it has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. This is why we encourage you to use your gifts in the church. It's why we don't say to everybody, uh, you should all speak in tongues. It's why we don't say you should all get up here and sing. It's why we don't say you should all get up here and preach. You should use what you're gifted in to serve the church. And I'll use what I'm gifted in to serve the church. And if we could all figure out just how to use what we're gifted in, each one of us, not looking at somebody else saying, I want to do what that person does or I want to do what that person does. You, you do what you do, I'll do what we do, and God has uniquely gifted the church to have everything it needs. That's the beauty of it. Because the Spirit of God knows exactly what all of our church needs. And so if we could figure out how to just do what God has gifted us in, we would, we would function as the body. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says it to the Ephesian church like this. There is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. The head of the church, the head of the body, means that Christ is the head of all the Christians, all the born-again believers. Somebody tell me, what is the definition of the church in the scriptures? What is, it, what is the church? Is the church a building? What is the church? The body of believers. The word church in the Bible means assembly. Assembly. So a church 
is not a Christian living in their home doing Christian life by themselves. That is not the church. The church is the assembly, and I know I'm preaching to the choir because you guys are all here. <laughs> but you have friends that think that they can do life outside of the assembly. And it's a problem, it's a mistake. We, we, the, church, the church is the body of Christ, and the definition of it is that we gather, that we assemble. We're supposed to be together. And we're supposed to be together using our gifts. It is the very word that the New Testament authors used to describe what is the body of believers, the people who believe in Jesus Christ. It's the assembly of God. And so we meet together, and it's important that we do that because they've defined us that way. It's the body of born-again believers from Pentecost until the day of Christ's return. This is exactly what Jesus tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He says, we know you're a teacher. No one can do the things that you do unless he is from God. And Jesus says to him, you will not see the kingdom of God unless you are born of water and of the Spirit. Unless you're purified and the Spirit of God is put inside of you. You will not see the kingdom of God. There's no distinction amongst believers for membership in the universal church. Neither slave nor free Jew nor Greek, there's no red, yellow, black, or white. There's no you speak a different language than me. There's no you look different or you talk different. There's no you're from a different side of town. There is no distinction in the church, which is why when Paul says he is the head of the body, the church, that is everybody who has gone from unbelieving to believing, who is now a part of the church. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, or he's the ruler. Your English translations will say he's the beginning, and that word is arche. It means beginning in some cases, but in some ways it means ruler or authority, which is the same exact context he gave for the first statement that he made, which is that he is the ruler over all creation. And I think he's saying the same thing here in verse 18, as he was saying in verse 15. In verse 15, he's the ruler over all creation at the very beginning, the first creation. Now here we are in verse 18, he's also the ruler over the second creation, which is going from unbeliever to believer. The second creation is the new creation. It's the recreation. It's you becoming a faithful follower of Jesus Christ and creating a new creation, which is the church, the body of believers. Christ is the first member of that body of believers. How is he the beginning of a new creation? How is he beginning of the church, which is something completely different than the lost humanity that we have right now? How is that the case? The answer is he's the firstborn of the dead. The next phrase. He's the firstborn of the dead. In other words, Christ came and he lived and he died and he resurrected to be a new creation. Resurrected to be something different than he was. He was a man, and then he was glorified. And that's something new. And when we follow you and I in Christ's footsteps, we die to our sin. We trust him. We give him all of our junk. And then we're resurrected to new life. We become a new creation. This is why we do baptism. By the way, we're doing baptism on August 20th for any of you who wants to get baptized. Come on, you were supposed to laugh. I already said that. <laughs> we baptize people because it's the sign of us being dead to our sin, following in Christ's footsteps, death to sin, and resurrection to new life, a new creation, something different. Uh, think about like this. Just kick this around in your brain for a second. Christ died for a, Christ physically died for a spiritual reality that did not belong to him. God created the world and humanity sinned and death came as a result of our sinfulness. Physical death came as a result of our spiritual sinfulness. Then Christ comes, 
And Hebrews chapter 4 said he was tempted and tried in every way, yet was without sin. Yet he still experienced death. He died a physical reality for a spiritual reality that was not his. He did not share in the sinfulness of humanity. And so if he died, it would be unjust for God to allow him to die because he did not share the spiritual reality that we all share. So it would be unjust for God to kill him or let him die as a punishment for sin of which he was not guilty of. But he allowed him to die so that he would take our sin and pay for it and that him and us would end up going on into eternity righteous, redeemed, reconciled. He died for a spiritual reality that was ours to bear, but he bore it himself on a cross. He's the, literally the firstborn of the dead. He's the substitution. That means if you want to believe in Jesus Christ, you want to follow him, you want to give your life to him, that means you get a second chance. Second chance at new life. Not the same person. Changed, transformed, given the spirit of God so that you can be new. Take it. Take the opportunity. Take the opportunity to follow God and have a second chance at life. Take the opportunity to repent, turn from the ways you used to live by, and be transformed. You get that being a new creation is the reason why prideful people never turn to Christ? Because a prideful person doesn't need to be new. <laughs> a prideful person's got it all figured out. A prideful person doesn't need to change. They don't need to be transformed. They just need to keep doing life, do it a little better next time. They just made mistakes in the past, but they'll do better next time. The prideful person has no interest in accepting the gospel or following Jesus Christ because they don't need to be transformed, don't need to be changed. But if you've gotten to the point in your life where you'd like, something's wrong, something needs to change, something's gotta be fixed, and I've tried to fix it, and I can't fix it, take the second chance at life from Jesus Christ. Take his righteousness and become a new creation. Paul says it to the Corinthian church like this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. What's the purpose of all this? What is the purpose of Jesus Christ becoming the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn of the dead? In the verse 18, I want you to circle that word, so. Circle it, circle it, circle, 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 circle. Apparently, I'm all about transitions in this series. So I had you do that last week, too. The word for. The word so in verse 18 is designating purpose. Purpose. What is the purpose? That he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. What, what is the purpose of God creating, allowing human beings to have will so that they could rebel against God? and then sending his son to pay their penalty. What's the purpose of all these things? Verse 18 says this. The purpose is so that Jesus Christ himself will come to have first place in everything. He has first rank, first authority over all of creation because he's God, because he was there when it was all created, because everything came into being through him and it's all for him. That's verse 15 and 16 and 17. And he is first rank over the church, the new creation, the body of believers that will spend eternity with him in heaven to have first place in all things. And so I was thinking about it this past week and the weeks past, and I thought to myself, okay, if God the Father's purpose in creating through the Son and creating everything for the Son and then sending him to die and making him the head of the church, if Christ's purpose of that was to make him first in everything, overall thing, whether we acknowledge it or not, then when we're Christians and we choose to believe in him and we choose to acknowledge that he's first in everything, then it should reflect in our life that he's first in everything. So, hashtag one life goal. The one life goal is that Jesus Christ would be first in everything. Everything. If all of creation, and as we see it progress, has been all working towards this, that Christ would be first in everything, then he ought to also be first in every part of our life. To make 
Christ first in everything, is, I think, the one goal that God would have us understand from who he has created Jesus Christ to be. What would it look like for a father or a mother to make Christ first in everything? It would mean that you teach your kids the ways of God, the things of God. You start early. Every day, day in and day out, these are the ways of God. Our family does things like this. Why? Why, Dad? Why, Mom? Why do we do things like this? We do things like this because we follow something outside of ourselves. We forgive because Jesus Christ forgave us everything. We offer grace. We offer mercy to our friends. Because Jesus Christ does. Give these things to your kids. We make Christ first and everything might look like protecting your kids' minds. My mom used to say it uh, like this to me. I love you enough to tell you no. Doggone it. How many times was she right? To say no, you can't spend hours and hours and hours on social media. You will destroy your mind. You will destroy your understanding of sexuality. You will be off a cliff so fast believing you think you know what is right and good and what will be satisfying to you because you're listening to the world that has 8.9 million posts about life goals, about buying a house and getting fit and whatever, whoever else that has nothing to do with God or Christ. So no, no, you can't spend five hours a day on social media. It will ruin you. What would it look like for a husband or a wife to make Christ first when they're contemplating divorce? Or when they're contemplating adultery? I think that the church doesn't acknowledge enough that people in marriages contemplate adultery. I think if we acknowledged more that husbands and wives go through marriage and, they, and sometimes it's good and sometimes you get to a point where you're looking at the other person going, what was I thinking? Or somebody comes along and you're like, the grass is greener. And what would it, like, what would it be like in that moment to make Christ first? To understand that Christ is always faithful to the church, that the picture of marriage between a man and a woman is Christ and the church, and that cannot be destroyed by a man and a man and a woman or a woman because it's Christ and the church. And outside of that, the glory of God is distorted. What would it be like for a husband to say, look, the church sins against Christ so much, and yet Christ loves her constantly? What would it be like for a woman to consider when she's thinking about another man, consider, would I ever give up on Christ? Would the church ever give up on its first love? What would it look like for couples who are sleeping together but they're unmarried to say, we're gonna make Christ first in our relationship? And I know what most are thinking. Do you know the domino effect of what that would cause? We could break up. You could make Christ first. We would have to move out. You could make Christ first. That would cost us lots of money. You're going to risk worshiping God with all of who you are for the thousands of dollars that it costs you to move out until you're married or to go down to the courtroom and pay 30 bucks and come back to the church and say, oh, we need somebody to marry us today because we can't, we're not really sure we're going to make it through tonight without sinning. What would it look like to put Christ first in your finances? To say, look, oh, my finances are a mess, so I'm just going to reorient. We're just going to reorient. What does God call healthy management of my finances? What would it look like for Christ to be first in your work as you work with integrity, you work with honesty, you build up the people around you that you work with, that they know that you believe and why you work the way that you do? What would it look like to make Christ first with social media consumption? I said this to the last service. 
scrolling, 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 scrolling. Here's what, here's what I want the Bible app to do. This is my suggestion to the Bible app. If you're listening, this is my suggestion to the Bible app. Make the Bible app scroll endlessly. Facebook scrolls endlessly. Instagram fo- endlessly. TikTok endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. What if we made the Bible app to just scroll endlessly? And when you got to the end of the book of Revelation, it just went back to Genesis and kept going. You could read for days. What would it mean for you to consider how much do I sit and scroll? How much am I learning from the world versus how much am I learning from the word of God? And to make Christ first in what you learn and what you input. What would, it make, what would it mean to make Christ first in your physical health? To take care of your body. To take care of what God has given you. What would it look like to make Christ first in your retirement? Oh, I used to serve Christ this way. And I was good at it. And then I retired. And now, I don't know. What would it look like to say, well, now I'm retired, God. What what do you want me to do? What's the first thing you want me to do? One thing at a time. What would it look like to make Christ first in the way that you speak, the way that you study your Bible, the way you seek for approval? What if you gave up your addiction to make Christ first in your life? What if you gave up twisted sexual satisfaction for making Christ first in your life. One life goal, hashtag. One life goal. If you have things off track in your life, if something's off, it seems weird, it seems strange, I'm not really sure how I got off track or where I got here or what's exactly even the problem, ask yourself this question. Is there something in my life related to this problem that I'm having that I have not made Christ first? My guess is you'll be able to identify it pretty quick. Money, success, approval, appearance, relationships, not being able to say no, fear. I've not made Christ first. And so my life is just spiraling. The new you, the true Christian, believer, you should have one life goal. One life goal is to make Christ first in everything. Now, how important is it? If that's the one life goal, to make Christ first in everything, how important is it that you believe in the right Christ? right? Spend your whole life making Christ first, and it's great, and it's wonderful, and then you get to heaven, and you realize, oh, but wrong Christ. Yikes. The substance of your faith matters. It matters that you believe in the right Jesus Christ, and it matters that you committed to him. Let me read this verse again. He is also the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning. He's the firstborn of the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. There's only one head of the church. It's not me. It's not Roger Ball. It's not the Pope. It's not Muhammad. It's not Joseph Smith or whichever prophet they have in command over their church right now. There is only one head of the church. It is Jesus Christ. I want you to take out your communion cups. Oh, hey, I figured out where my, my marker was supposed to be. How do you make Christ first? How do you make Christ first? Where do you even start? Well, you start by acknowledging whatever God has been nudging you for the last 25 minutes. I don't know what that is. You start with one thing. If you're thinking to yourself, man, the the list is long. Make Christ first. Man, I got a list. Just start with one thing. Start with one thing. Figure out how to make Christ first, maybe in your finances. Figure out how to make Christ first, maybe in your marriage. Figure that out, then move on to the next thing. God's patient. He'll work with you. He'll teach you one step at a time. He isn't, he's not asking you to walk out these doors and be like, you know what? Make Christ first in every part of my life. Done. And you walk out and you got it all sorted. It doesn't work like that. One, one piece at a time. Consider this. This is where you start. Make in Christ first in your life. You start right here. This is the reason why sacrificed everything for you. You gave his body and his blood in your place. And when the scriptures talk about taking communion, they talk about examining yourself. And so we've just for now, for a whole sermon, been self-examining. What area of life 
have I struggled to make Christ first? Now he's asking me. And so the goal is, the goal is not to put communion down and say, yep, not ready to make Christ first yet. Well, the scripture says to the, Paul says to the Corinthian church, examine yourselves, then take communion. Get right with God. Then remember the body and blood of Christ. Don't skip it. Don't say I'm not ready. Because the Spirit of God nudges us and moves us, every one of us in different parts of our lives. Would you open the bottom of the cup? When he had taken the cup, Jesus, that is, and given thanks, he said, oh man, I dropped my communion. If I was in a Catholic church, I need a priest to come and get it from me. Okay. It's a symbol, people. It's a symbol. It's a symbol. When he had taken the cup, he had given thanks. He said, that's why the, they should not put that on the bottom of the cup. That's like the worst idea ever. <laughs> Taking the cup and giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken for you. Did you open the top of the cup? In the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this is the cup which is poured out for you is the covenant of my blood. Where you start, making Christ first in all things in your life is right here. You renew, you remember, this is who you follow, the one who paid everything for you. You, you don't follow the number of zeros in your bank account, you don't follow what your friends say or your parents say or your work, coworkers say. You don't follow what social media says. This is the one you follow. This is the only one who is willing to give his life as payment for yours. No amount of money can pay for it. Doesn't matter if you have a million friends or 10 million views on Instagram. This is the only sacrifice that matters for you. So this is where you start. And then piece by piece, you work your life to make Christ first in all things. This is the body, blood of Christ poured out for your forgiveness. Let's pray. God, you refine each one of us piece by piece. And we're thankful because every one of us that has come to you in our sin and asked for your forgiveness, God, we have desperately desired for you to transform us. If you're here today and you have never taken the first step to give your life to Christ, you would pray a prayer that goes something like this. God, I need forgiveness. I need hope. I need rest. And I've been searching for it in every place besides you. I've been searching for it in money or I've been searching for it in a relationship. And today, I'm making a choice to make you first in my salvation, to make you first in every part of my life. And I need your help. God, I submit to you today and for the rest of my life to follow you, to chase after you, to try to make you first in my life in every way. And anyone who's willing to pray that prayer today, in this room, God's faithful to forgive. He's faithful to sacrifice for you. He's faithful to forgive anyone who comes. So God, we praise you. You're faithful to save every single one of us in the room who's willing to come to you in humility, in our hopelessness, in our pain, in our despair, hand it over to you and say, God, transform me. 
God, make me new. God, for the saint who's been living, trying to conform their life to you for 30, 40, 50 years now, would you continue to transform them? Use them in their retirement. Use them in their new season of life. Use them with their kids and grandkids. Use them with their great-grandkids. Use them to serve the church in a new way that they never have before. God, for the young believers in this church, teach us piece by piece what it looks like to follow you with every part of our life. God, keep on us. Don't let us wander or go astray. God, we thank you that you are but a conversation away for every believer. Thank you that to send the Spirit of God to minister to us in every moment of our life. God, draw us together as one body, one church. Don't let us become disjointed, disunified. Help us to stay united. God, we thank you and we praise you. Change us, transform us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.